All right, looks like I'm live. I will wait for just a sec to uh, people to jump on here before I get started. All right, well, uh, if you guys have, uh, oh, what's up, Jamie? How's it going? Um, well, if you guys have been uh, have been watching, what's up, guys? If you guys have been uh, watching the last couple of videos that I'm done, I've been basically every week going through a chunk of the Book of James and uh, and just teaching on that. Uh, I'm just reading it, breaking it down, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm doing a leading a Bible study at my church that really corresponds uh, with that. Usually Thursday nights we meet up and and do our thing, and then um, you know Friday or Saturday I'm jumping on here. Um, bringing it to you guys. So anyway, tonight we are going to be in James chapter 3. Um, last week we went through the second half of James 2. I think we're actually going to make it all the way through a chapter this time. Usually I've been doing uh, you know, about a half a chapter at a time. Tonight I think we're going we're gonna to be able to make it all the way through 3. I like to keep these videos kind of short. But uh, so give you kind of a real quick crash course of the book of James written by the half brother of Jesus, who is basically the most influential elder, you know, head pastor of the biggest church in the hub of um, Christendom at the time it was written. This was a very early book when it was written. It was um, written shortly after um, really the events. Well, many of the events that took place in Acts, um, this was probably written in the 40s AD. Um, so very, very early book, but uh, James really kind of starts out, he breaks down uh, just some encouragement to us, um, or, or to believers specifically at that time. There was a great persecution against the church at that time, and he, he wrote to really encourage them on how to look at, how to deal with their, um, just their trials, and how to look at those as not just something to be solved, but something from God with a purpose. Um, he kind of goes in, he, he contrasts uh, true religion and false religion. Um, in the next chapter, chapter two is all about works and faith and what is the relationship between faith and works? What is the relationship between hearing the word and doing the word, right? If we actually have true saving faith, we are doing the word. We're not just, um, we're not just going through the motions. Um, and I, I, last week I actually broke down three different types of faith. A lot of the, the reformers had three different words that they would describe faith with. Um, you know, one was a sort of a, a propositional truth type of faith. Uh, the next one was a faith that uh, you know you're you're sort of actively putting something into, but then the third type of faith is when you actually actually place your trust in it. You actually you know kind of put your money where your mouth is. And and James is going to say if if uh, if our faith doesn't lead us to do that, it's a dead faith and it's it's actually a demonic faith. So James had some really really harsh words there. But um, tonight we're gonna we're gonna transition um, into really this is a wisdom chapter more than anything. Um, reading this is honestly a lot closer to reading the book of Proverbs than anything. Um, this is really sort of the New Testament's um, counterpart, I guess, to a, a book of Proverbs. There is so much wisdom in there. There's not really a ton of that in the New Testament. I mean, there's certainly wisdom, but not things that are written, you know, chunks of do these things and live and, you know, and, and here's how you guide your life. But um, anyway, so that, that's kind of where we're picking up. Um, this evening here. Um, so I'm going to start out, I'm going to read through half the chapter or so, um, and then I'm just going to kind of go through and break it down, and uh, we're going to get some good application out of this. Let me switch over to my notes here. Cool, there we go. All right, so it starts out, James chapter 3, verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by such strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder whenever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, 
and with it we curse people who were made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Um, and that's where we're going to pause for, for right now and break it down. Um, so <laughs> the, uh, the first verse here, kind of hit me especially hard. This is always, always one that I've, I've had in mind because I've very much been, I, I've had, I have a passion to, to teach um, and teach the word and things like that. Um, and what's funny is um, my pastor texted me uh, last week and asked me to preach for him uh, in a couple weeks here. And I've never done that before. And uh, literally the first Bible verse that I read after, you know, I told him that I would was... <laughs> James 3, chapter 1, not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Um, so that was just kind of a uh, sobering thing, but I mean also, you know, kind of funny that just that was that was the one, but but yeah, certainly very, very sobering. Um, so like I said, so, so chapter 3 here, he's really transitioning. Um, in chapter 2, James was talking a lot about doing the word, it's hearing the word and then doing the word. And and then in chapter three, he's really changing the subject from doing to talking and how we speak. Um, and an interesting thing about that is we're always going to get, well, not always, many times we're going to get into more trouble from speaking truth than we will doing good. Um, for example, um, you know, if, if your life is marked by good deeds, and, and it should be if you're a believer, um, right. So if you're out, you know, like James describes in uh, the first the first chapter, he says real religion is taking care of orphans and widows and, um, you know, sort of the the have nots of, of society. But, uh, you know, you know, you're not going to get in a lot of trouble for that um, from like the unbelieving world. There's not going to be a lot of pressure um, to do those things. However, there is going to be pressure when you start talking about Jesus Christ and about repentance. Um that's just kind of an interesting note that I had on that. This is obviously James is kind of talking more in a negative sense, but that just sort of positive application um, kind of kind of hit me there. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely get into more trouble from speaking than doing in a lot of ways, specifically if it's good things. Um, but, uh, but, but really this theme that he starts out with here is, again, just the power of words, you know, and, and small things can have such great results. Um, and it's always words that change history, right? So you have a positive change. I talked a lot about last week about the, uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, back in the 1500s and, and just the huge um, really movement of God at that time. Um, you know, and this, this is an example of how words were powerful, right? So you have Martin Luther nailing the 95 Thesis to the door in Wittenberg, and, and basically what he was doing is saying these things are, are wrong in the church, um, and he was opening these things up to debate, things that he saw that were contrary to the teaching of Scripture, and, uh, and that, you know, providentially uh, coincided with the invention of the printing press and things like that. So what happened is just these words spread, and these words created this movement, um, you know, and then this Reformation happens all across Europe, just this very powerful thing. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, you know, a negative aspect of that is, uh, you know, like Nazi propaganda for, for what they did to uh, the Jewish people um, in the World War II era and leading up to that. Um, again, those things start with the power of words. Um, so words can do either great or terrible things. Um, you know, classic uh, Ben Parker quote, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, so again, we just, we just see this huge emphasis on the tongue and on the power of the tongue. <sighs> on that note, for we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses, they obey us, and we guide their whole bodies as well, and look at ships as well. They're, they're so large, but they're driven by strong winds. They're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Um, so, so again, it's, it's just this theme, and he's using a couple different examples of... Um, of just the power of these small things. Um, there, there's some potential confusion here that I want to address initially, um, just lest we sort of fall into error here. Um, you know, and, and that is just a greater theme of the Bible and of the New Testament and of redemption and things like that, um, and just much of the teachings of Christ, um, and especially Proverbs, especially Proverbs. I 
read through all of Proverbs in the last uh, like two days, but just there's so much in there about how the mouth is a reflection of the heart, um, right? Your words reflect character. Um, you know, Proverbs says, out of the abundance, the mouth speaks. Um, so again, we just, we see that huge emphasis that, you know, we talked about in the first, uh, the first couple weeks, uh, specifically on James chapter one and in the beginning of chapter two, we talked a lot about identity and identity in Christ. And, and this, is, this should be a reflection of that. If our identity is in Christ, if our heart has been changed by Christ, there are certain words that should accompany our lives. Um, so, so we see again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, have we have we been changed by God? And if so, how does that change our cats? Go away. Um, how does that how does that change the way that we talk? Um, you know, do we use our words to take joy away from people, to steal joy from people? I, I remember I had a buddy um, years ago who it seemed like was just. He, he was just always kind of, it felt like doing what he could to take my joy from me, right? Like I get, you know, a new vehicle or something. And he's like, oh yeah, it's all right. But you know, what about this? And you know, I've heard those, you know, those are kind of unreliable or, you know, whatever it is. It, it's just, it's this persistent thing that, that we can use our words to just really steal from people, to steal life from people. Um, and are, are we doing that? Are we using our words to lash out at people? Um, and another thing related to our our identity there is, um, you know, when our identity is in Christ, things that threaten us aren't going to threaten us to that same degree than they would in other in other circumstances. For example, if your identity is in, um, you know, your relationship with, you know, your husband or wife or your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, if you the core of your identity is in, in that relationship, you're giving that person a huge amount of power over you. You're getting your validity from them. You're being validated by them. You need them in order to tell you who you are, um, right? So so the the key wrong thing there is having wrong identity, having identity in the wrong place. Or if your identity is in, you know, being the best, you know, guy at your work, um, you know, at your job. Okay, cool. That's fine. Um, but then what happens when somebody uh, comes in who is better than you, um, right? You're going to end up, you're going to lash out at him. You're going to use your words to cut and to um, try and try and harm him or, or try and bring him down. Why? Because your identity is not in Christ. Your identity is functionally in something else. Um, you know, and, and when we're dethroned from that role, when we're dethroned from being, you know, the best at whatever, um, you know, our words really reveal who we are. Um, they really reveal where our identity is. Um, again, I, I've kind of said this in a few different ways here, but a transformed heart and a transformed identity cause transformed words. If we have been redeemed by Christ, if we have been given a new heart by Christ, that's going to change the way we speak. Um, if you want to know what um, what issues you're dealing with, or like if you're dealing with anger or something, just listen to yourself. Listen to your words. Um, your words are going to reveal what is true about your heart. Oh, let's see. My uh, ESV had a good study note on here. That was for, okay, that was for number two. Um, okay, cool. So, so this is now in relation to what it said earlier about um, being a perfect man if you uh, don't stumble in your words. Um, and this is, uh, again, from the ESV study notes. It says, a person's words reflect his character and thus are the key to his whole being. James emphasizes the importance of good works, but also acknowledges that all Christians stumble, a metaphor for sinning, in many ways. James call, James call for good works, therefore, must not be seen as expecting perfection. When James says a person who can control his mouth is a perfect man, he rather probably has um, absolute perfection in view. Uh, it is a perfection, however, that will only be attainable in heaven. Still, he believes that we should always seek to grow in holiness. Um, and that, that's a huge note, and that's a huge um, just peace on repentance in general, is we understand that, you know, in this life, we're never, we're never going to be perfect as, as Christ is perfect. Um, you know, repentance is less about where we're at right now. It more has to do with the direction that we're facing. Um, so, so depending on where you are in life, you know, I like, I, I heard a really good football analogy once. It's like, you know, well, one guy, you know, received the ball at his own one yard line and, you know, and then he made it all the way to the 10 yard line. And, you know, that was where he, you know, got tackled or whatever. It's like, Hey, he made it nine yards there where somebody else, you know, might've, might've gotten the, got caught the football at the, 
you know, the 80 yard line, but he only made it two yards, right? So he's further along, but it's, he's, he's made less progress. So, so that is just to say that we, we need to be viewing um, our repentance and our godliness and things like that. Um, in terms of where we are now, contrasted to where we were uh, when we were saved, we're looking for, we're looking for progress. We're looking for a progression towards godliness and a progression towards Christ likeness. Um, Cool. So, 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 so there are a couple examples here. Um, the examples that he uses are, you know, bits in the mouths of horses and animals and the rudder on a ship and just these powerful things. Um, you know, one other example of, of just the power of words is, you know, I mean, you look at some statistics and, you know, there's 4,400 teen deaths um, every year where the primary cause is bullying. Um, that's words. That's the power of words. You know, teens who are bullied are four to nine times more likely, depending on which statistics you're looking at. Um, to try and commit suicide. Um, if you look at something like slander, um, you know, entire ministries are, are destroyed from that and, um, and things like that. One of the pastors that I uh, used to follow um, several years ago, some of you guys might be familiar with uh, Mark Driscoll. He was a huge, you know, hugely successful um, pastor on the, the West Coast and a great, great Bible teacher. But um, he certainly made some mistakes, but there were a lot of slanderous allegations uh, against him. There was one book that he came out with, and um, you know there, there was this big headline that came out like, "Oh, he plagiarized in this book," um, and you know that's the headline everyone hears and everyone hears, and they're spreading around this information, and whatever. And and his ministry eventually was shut down. Now again, there were there were some other things that he did wrong there that also contributed to it. But the point is, there was this this news that came out that said, "Oh, he um, you know he plagiarized here." And then, uh, you know, there was kind of an investigation on that. And then really the publisher came back and said, well, no, it wasn't really plagiarism. He didn't maybe cite this source as well as he should have. But, um, you know, it's certainly not plagiarism. And we're looking forward to working with him in the future and publishing more of his books. But it was like the other story had already gotten out. People had already heard of that. People were already spreading around that, um, that misinformation. And it did a ton of damage. Um, so, again, all this is just to say um, how powerful our words are. Um, so also a tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Um, one quote that's always that really stuck out to me, um, I'm a dad, I have like 50 kids, um, <laughs> but, uh, but one quote that really stuck out to me from uh, the book Wild at Heart by John Eldridge, I don't fully agree with all the theology and stuff that, um, that John Eldridge alludes to in his book, but there's a lot of good stuff to it. I, I would call it very much a you know, eat the meat, spit out the bones type of thing. But um, from the, the book Wild at Heart, um, where he, he really just writes a lot about um, masculinity and the, the essence of man. But anyway, he has this quote in here that I read years ago that just really stuck out with me. He says, every boy in his journey to become a man takes an arrow to the center of his heart in the place of his strength because the wound is rarely discussed and even more rarely healed. Every man carries a wound and that wound is nearly always given by his father. Um, you know, for me, just realizing the profoundness of that, um, I have, I actually, I have six kids actually, um, but, you know, just, just seeing the weight of that, um, you know, and, and one of my um, constant prayers is that God would protect my children from, um, from me, from my, um, my mistakes and that sort of thing. And, um, and this really goes back to the first chapter of this verse, too, where he says, not many of you should become teachers, for you know that what you teach will be judged with greater strictness. Um, so there, there is just this weight to, um, to teaching and this weight to authority. When you have that, you know, you're responsible for the words that you say even more so than um, what somebody else uh, would be who's, who's not in that role. So, so again, this is um, just very powerful here. Um, move on. Uh, he says, uh, let's see, this is, I guess, the end of verse five. He says, how great is a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the course of the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. So one thing that's interesting here is he, he talks about it's words that are staining the whole body, um, which is interesting. It, it continues on with the same theme, like I, I read earlier from Proverbs, it says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, and, and here he's talking about how words can stain us. And, and he also used that word stain in the first uh, the first chapter in uh, James 1, verse 
27. Uh, he says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Um, so it's just interesting how he uses that because we see that that, that staining is coming from within. And, and James already said in the last chapter that, you know, that the evil things, the evil intents that we have, those are, those are not from God. Those are from our heart. Those are from inside of us. So it's from inside that we, that we stain ourselves. And it's like those, those careless words just um, really add icing to the cake in terms of, of staining to us. Um, let's see. And, uh, you know, and, and even Jesus said here on the same theme, he said, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled, but whatever comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles a person, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to each but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So Jesus is just kind of in this text, sorry, I didn't give any context to that, but that's Jesus speaking to um really the subject of cleanliness and he's saying no it's not these things that you're doing on the outside with your body it's it's what's inside defines you and you know and this is a huge uh, a huge contending point of the christian biblical worldview in contrast to the humanistic non-christian secular worldview um you know the the secular worldview um is really bent on okay well you have problems you have issues you know, you just need to reach deep inside, and you know, in the New Age movement too, you just need to reach deep into to the good that's inside of you and, and really connect with that. Or, you know, you need you need education or or whatever to um, to fix this issue. But the the Bible and the biblical worldview is going to say, no, that's not the case. There is nothing good that is in your heart. It's from your heart that these things come. You don't need to look deep down into yourself. You need to look out to Christ, and you need to be redeemed, and you need Him to give you a new heart. Every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature has been tamed, um, can be tamed, and has been tamed for mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Again, that, that restless evil is from the heart. The tongue is from the heart. He says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Uh, one of the things I always look for when I'm studying the Bible is attributes or titles or characteristics of who God is. Right here he gives us two. He says, we bless our Lord and our Father. Um, and we kind of look at what those things encompass. I tease those out a little bit in, in past times, but that is who God is. He is our Lord. He's not just our Savior. He's our Lord, and he is our Father. That is the relationship we have here, we have with him. But he's saying, and we use it to curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So another thing dealing with biblical worldview and understanding um, sort of some of the whys, um, you know, why is it wrong to harm our neighbor? Why is it wrong to uh, cut cut our neighbor down with, with our tongue or, or with whatever, uh, he tells us, well, why? Well, these people are made in the likeness of God. They're image bearers of God. That's our foundation for human value. That's the foundation for, the, for us valuing someone else's life. Um, is because they are image bearers of God. They are representing God. Um, you know, they're they're now they're either doing a good job or a bad job of it. But but that is uh, what the Bible means when it talks about transforming our hearts, transforming our lives, conforming ourselves to the image of Christ. As we are, um, you know, we are being changed by the Word, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, we are being changed so that we rightly bear the image of God and, and not do so wrongly. Um, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Um, let's see. I think I had another good note that was worth reading here. Yeah, this is on uh, note on, on verse 9 here. It says, it is both hypocrisy and folly to bless God during a worship event and then after the service to curse someone made in God's image. If, if this curse implies the common practice of invoking the name of God against someone, then it is doubly heinous. Um, so again, just, just recognizing the value um, of our neighbor because of who he is, who he is created um, as or who, whose image he bears. All right, and, and then he gets into, uh, you know, can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Um, so we see kind of along the same line as some of Jesus' analogies there when he's saying, 
really, Jesus says, honestly, the exact same thing. Jesus uses it in a little bit of a different context. I talked briefly, briefly last week about um, just this analogy of where it's like our choices are a reflection of our character. Our choices don't determine our character. They don't cause us to be the way we are. Rather, our choices are a product of who we are. So it's kind of like in, uh, you know, if you picture like a crane game, there's this chest and the chest has all these little trinkets in it. And, you know, our choices and our will is sort of like the little crane that goes up and we get to pick, you know, this trinket or that trinket. Um, right. But, it, but it, our choices don't determine what's inside the chest. Our nature does um, and, and what we need to do is we need God to, to change our heart. We need a new heart. We need new things to choose from, new things to, to pick. Um, and I, I think James is loosely referencing to that, not as much so as, um, as what Jesus was and that we talked about that last week. But that's um, I, I went into that a little bit more last week. Um, I'm going to move forward here. Um, so we have, really, we have five more verses here. So I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly. Um, but uh, starting at verse 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom. Uh, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. Uh, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Um, so as I mentioned towards the beginning of this video, James is gonna, James does a lot of contrasting for us. Um, in chapter 1, he contrasts true religion with false or vain religion. Um, in chapter 2, he contrasts um, true faith, saving faith, with dead faith or demonic faith. And then here uh, in chapter three, James is going to contrast true wisdom and uh, an earthly or, or a demonic wisdom. He's even going to go so far as to say here. So, so let's look at these a little bit. So we have um, true wisdom versus ungodly wisdom. So true religion or true, uh, true wisdom, excuse me, um, is meek, pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, merciful, produces good fruit, impartial, sincere. Um, and the, the fruit of those things is going to be righteousness and peace. Now, on the contrary, we have this false, uh, this false wisdom that is, is prideful, it's earthly, it's unspiritual, demonic, jealous, um, produces bad fruit, and is ultimately marked by disorder. So we have the fruits of each being righteousness and peace on one hand and disorder on the other hand. Um, so we can look at the fruit to see um, when and where we're walking in wisdom. I, I don't know how I just now saw that hashtag lit. That's what's up, Rebecca. That is what's up. Um, cool. Let's see. And I, I had another good note I wanted to read here. Um, why is an understanding conduct? This is on verse 13. Wisdom for James is not merely intellectual, but also behaviorable. Uh, behaviorable. Wow. Uh, but it's also behavioral. Meekness of wisdom. Uh, meekness, or sometimes translated gentleness, was considered weakness by the Greeks, but Jesus elevated it to a primary Christian virtue. I love it when there's Christian virtues that are countercultural. Um, that's so good. So, so yeah, it's interesting. This contrast. Okay, so the, the world in this case um, considers meekness weakness. Um, you know, in Christ, and and then James following say, no, this is a strength. This is a Christian virtue. This is something awesome. Uh, meekness comes not from cowardice or passivity, but rather from, here we go, meekness comes rather from trusting God and therefore being set free from anxious self-promotion. I'm going to read that one more again because that was hashtag lit, Rebecca. Probably I regret saying that. Um, <laughs> meekness comes not from cowardice or passivity, but rather from trusting God and therefore being set free from anxious self-promotion. Um, that's awesome. That's, that's so good. I love that. Um, you know, and it really, it really kind of bears testament to what James laid down earlier and, and what I was really kind of pulling out of that earlier where, where it comes down to our identity. If our identity is in Christ, we're not going to have this need to be constantly lifting ourselves up and showing how good we are and proving, um, proving our, our worth, right? Because our worth is in Christ. Our worth is that, um, you know, that we're, we're image bearers of God. We're created in the image of God. Not only that, Christ died for us to redeem us from sin. 
um, you know, he, he purchased us from that. And, and this is where our value is. This is where our identity is. And it is out of that identity that, that we work. Um, it's out of that identity that, that we do things for the gospel. It's out of that identity that it, it's not just something that's like, okay, these things are true about me. Yes, Lord. Now I'm just going to sit here and not do anything, right? That's not how it works. Um, and especially it's not how it works in the book of James, because James, you know, again, hear the word, do the word, hear the word, do the word. Um, you know, real, real religion is, is working. Real faith is working. It's doing um, your your real faith is going to lead you to something. Your real identity in Christ is going to cause your behaviors to be different. It's going to cause your words to be different. Um, Cool. So on that note, I think that that wraps up everything here. Um, just a half an hour. Not too terrible. Um, awesome. Well, anyway, I love you guys. I'm looking forward to next week. Um, hope you all have a great weekend. Love you guys. All right. Have a fantastic night. Have a fantastic weekend.